Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Libby Casey, anchor covering politics and accountability. Thank you so much for joining me today for two important conversations about gender equity. My first guest is Dr. Rowena Johnston from AMFAR, who's here to talk about women in clinical research. Dr. Johnston, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thanks so much for the invitation. A reminder to our audience, you can join our conversation and ask questions by sending a tweet to the handle Post Live. Dr. Johnston, I want to start by asking you about the breaking news this week that a woman appears to be the third person ever cured of HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. And doctors used umbilical cord blood. What does this mean for the future of AIDS research and treatment? I think this case is actually interesting in a number of ways. And you brought up, first of all, that she's a woman. And this is the first time that a stem cell transplant has been used um, seemingly successfully, we're going to have to wait to see, but she's possibly cured of HIV, and if so, she'll be the first woman uh, as a stem cell transplant. But as you also point out, they used cord blood in this case, um, and there was actually kind of an important reason for that, and that is that uh, the woman in question is not uh, white, and the stem cells that are more likely to cure HIV come from uh, white donors of Northern European descent. And they're unlikely to be a good match for uh, people who are not of Northern European descent. And, and this woman is not. And um, when you use cord blood, uh, you actually have a better chance of matching a wider range of people. So I think it's really exciting not only that she's the first woman, but also the first non-white person. And that, um, you know, all the research that we've been doing over all of these years looking for a cure for HIV is starting to pay off for a broader range of people. Mm. It's so important that you brought up this question of race because people may not realize how significant that development is in particular. Can you just expand a little more on, on how the cord blood uh, may open up sort of possibilities? How does it get your mind thinking about what could come next? Uh, you know, I think I actually want to start with a caveat, and that is um, we should keep in mind that this is unlikely to be the kind of cure that we would use for a lot of people. Um, but for people who are living with HIV and who have cancer, and if their cancer requires treatment with a stem cell transplant, then I think if, you know, for those people who are not of white race, we now um, have at least pretty good evidence that this is, this is an intervention that can work. Um, she's now uh, seemingly clear of her cancer as well as her HIV. And, you know, as we were talking about before, she's not of white descent. Um, which means she doesn't need to look for an adult stem cell donor. Um, she can go to a, a cord blood, or her doctors can go to a cord blood um, biobank and find a cord blood unit uh, that could be used as part of the transplant. And because those units don't need to be, you know, as specific a tissue match as when those stem cells come from adults, um, then we, you know, we could start to see a broader range of people, again, people living with HIV who need a stem cell transplant for their cancer, under those circumstances, I think we could start to see a broader range of people who would qualify for this treatment. Well, let's talk about gender equity. Women make up about half of the HIV cases globally. And as of 2016, AMFAR found that women represented just 11% of participants in cure trials, 19% of the people in antiretroviral drug trials. Why have clinical trials relied so heavily on male participation? Oh, I think there uh, really are a lot of factors that go into that. Um, I, th I think, you know, historically, mm, there really are a lot of factors. Historically, um, men have been the people who have conducted the most clinical trials, and um, physicians tend to be more male than female. And so I think, you know, right off the bat, um, physicians actually of either gender tend to be a little more hesitant to recommend uh, participation in a clinical trial to a female patient. So, you know, we start from that vantage point. And then, you know, to be fair, it is actually quite relatively difficult to recruit and retain women in clinical trials for, for a number of reasons. Being in a clinical trial can take a lot of your time and effort. And women are more likely to be um, those responsible for child care and elder care. Uh, they're more likely to have the kind of job that you can't take discretionary time off. And, you know, maybe a lot of people wouldn't be comfortable asking their boss for time off to participate in an HIV clinical trial because it might require actually disclosing what your HIV status is. 
And, you know, women are also uh, more likely to be subject to intimate partner violence, which can also kind of prevent a lot of the ways in which they interact with the outside world. So there are a number of those kinds of what we would call structural barriers to, to getting women into clinical trials. There's also, I think, a little bit of a, a sense from physicians that women are messy. Um, you know, this is, this is a quote that I've heard more than once. And it's true, you know, women have menstrual cycles, which means that our hormones fluctuate across the month. And those fluctuating hormone levels can um, make it difficult to interpret the effects of a drug, for example, because the hormones themselves may have an effect on that. Uh, we also know that across the menstrual cycle, there are behavior changes. I think a lot of women could um, attest to that. There's, you know, there's a lot of sex differences um, that are due to hormones or chromosomes that can make interpreting the data from women a little bit more tricky. Of course, you know, the counter argument is, as you said, you know, women are, are 50 percent of the general population, a little bit more than 50 percent of the HIV population. So we really do actually need to make that effort to make sure that we're protecting the health of women. Hmm. Those numbers I referenced were from 2016. Do you have a sense that it's shifted at all in the years since? You know, I have been watching other people publish in this same area, and unfortunately, those numbers really aren't improving very much. Now, you know, in terms of cure research, um, we would call that, you know, it's fairly early stage research. And so the earlier stage any research is in any disease area, the less likely you are to have a lot of women in that research. And again, I think um, people conducting clinical trials may feel like, well, let's just try it out in men because, you know, they're not going to get pregnant. We're not going to do any damage to a fetus, for example. Let's just try it out in men first before we start recruiting women uh, into larger trials that might happen later. I do think, though, that that's actually a missed opportunity. I mean, of course, certainly we want to ensure the health of women and that we're doing the best that we can to protect their health. But I think um, there's a real advantage to having women in earlier trials because you you actually have the opportunity to learn something, not only about women, but depending on the drug or the intervention, how that how that uh, behaves in women, you actually may learn something that is important for all people. You know, even just something that I'm sure we're all familiar with, because we've certainly been getting a lot of news about COVID the last couple of years. We've all heard that women are um, less likely to have very severe de disease or to die of COVID. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could actually learn from those women, what is it that's happening in the bodies of women um, that leave them less susceptible to such severe consequences? Might it be an effect of hormones? Might it be an effect of chromosomes? And let's see what we can learn from that and, and turn that into treatment for all people who are at risk of getting COVID. And talk to us about how drugs treatments might affect women differently than men and how you, know, you need that research to show how women could be affected. Yeah, you absolutely do need that research. And it's very well known that women are more likely to have um, side effects and adverse effects from drugs. And that's really across the board, across all kinds of classes of drugs. And, you know, I, I would invite people to even consider something, you know, very common that we're all, you know, familiar with or have observed. And that is that alcohol, even alcohol, affects women and men very differently. And it's not only a matter of body size. Um, there is an enzyme that metabolizes or breaks down alcohol. And that enzyme is present in the bodies of women and men at different levels. And so there's really a biological basis, regardless of your body size, regardless of your experience with alcohol, that does differentiate how well you're going to be able to metabolize and, and tolerate, if you like, um, alcohol. Something even as simple as that. But, you know, across the board, women are more likely to have side effects, not least because there are very few drugs where there's a different dose recommended for women and men. So women have more side effects probably due to differences in how they metabolize. It's not only body size. Um, across the menstrual cycle, for example, um, the way we excrete just anything that comes into our bodies, the, the way fat is deposited around our bodies, um, that can lead to differences in how long a drug stays in your system and how it's broken down. 
And all of this adds up to kind of a, a cumulative greater amount of drug in your system and therefore a greater likelihood of side effects. We really actually do need to do a much better job of understanding side effects in women and really at the point at which a drug is approved, do a much, much better job at recommending different doses for women and men on the basis of those different metabolic um, effects that we see in men and women. Mm. Let's talk about getting women involved in studies, especially those longitudinal studies. Uh, what are the rates of female participation and, and how challenging is it to recruit women to participate in them? You mentioned some of the, the variables that make it hard for women to sign up for HIV studies, for example. Do you see that across the board? I think, you know, depending on what the disease is and what the, the actual clinical trial, for example, is asking of participants, you know, I think if it's a survey, you know, it's, it's much easier to get people to sign up and participate. And uh, if you're injecting something like a COVID vaccine, for example, um, there was actually a little bit more trouble recruiting people. But if, you know, you know, progressively more difficult when you get to the point at which you're asking people to give blood or even tissue samples, it becomes more and more difficult uh, to get anybody to participate. And then you have those additional barriers that face women. So I, I do think there are some things that people could do differently. You could, first of all, educate um, physicians and people running clinical trials as to just how important and how worthwhile it is to get women into their clinical trials. You're, you're not only serving women because you do want to protect their health and well-being, but really, I mean, I want people to seriously consider that you have the opportunity to learn something that you never would have learned if you only have men in your trial, something that really could improve the health of everybody. So you need to get physicians on board and excited about the idea that we really want to have women in our trial. Now, you know, I mentioned that women are more likely to be caregivers. Like what if we offered either a childcare facility at the place that the clinical trial is being done, or at least some reimbursement for childcare expenses while the woman goes to the clinical trial. I do think that could make a difference. Another thing is that uh, clinical trials often happen during office hours, which is when you know the rest of us are working as well. So what if there were expanded hours um, outside of you know the nine to five, nine to six range that people might be working that could you know facilitate the ability of people who don't have flexibility with their jobs to actually still go and see you know, the people running the trial, receive whatever the intervention is, give whichever samples it is that they need to give. And, you know, I think we can really make better steps towards making it a friendlier environment and, and something that makes it much easier for everyone to participate. Let's talk about the FDA's rules around women of childbearing age and how they can participate in clinical trials. Uh, first of all, explain why that is a concern and if it's changing, especially, you know, we, we've seen such important research and evidence being done about the COVID vaccine specifically, not just among women of childbearing age, but actually pregnant women. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it has really been um, quite cyclical in the United States over the years. I mean, we can go back to the 1950s, maybe early 1960s, and the concern was first raised because of thalidomide. And, you know, very little testing was done on thalidomide in women. Um, but after it had been approved for other uh, uses, um, pregnant women did start using it because it, it seemed to deal well with uh, morning sickness. And of course, we know that it was tragic uh, results that came out of that. And in response to that, the FDA first actually essentially banned women from participating in clinical trials because there was concern about uh, protecting the health of an unborn child. And it wasn't until 1993, which is really kind of astonishingly recently, um, that the FDA changed their mind on that and, and, in, and said that women could participate in clinical trials. Now, a lot of the time, women who participate in trials are asked to use not just one, but two methods of contraception. That can be a barrier. Even if you're taking oral contraceptive pill, for example, they might still ask you to uh, use some other method of diaphragm, condoms, whatever some other contraceptive method is, because there is really just so much concern you know, when we don't know what might happen to a fetus. And then you fast forward mm. to later in the, the 1990s, where the FDA tried to um, open up further to the participation of women. And, and it was really only 1998, if memory serves, uh, that the FDA requires that drug companies present 
data that women were included in their clinical trial and that the efficacy of the intervention, how successful the intervention is, that those data should be presented to the FDA. So, I mean, that's great. And, and I think it's maybe two, three years ago that the FDA is now even providing guidance about how to include pregnant women in clinical trials. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to ask pregnant women to take something like the COVID vaccine, but, you know, pregnant women have other health issues that don't stop just because they become pregnant. You know, they might have some chronic condition that they have concerns about whether they can continue medications that they've been taking before they got pregnant. If you're going to ask pregnant women to take a medication to improve their health, then you need to have the data that show that it's safe and effective to take those medications during pregnancy. And, you know, there are concerns because drugs can have effects on fetuses, you know, while they're in development. And there are certain critical times during development that you really don't want something to go wrong. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a really quite a hard balancing act. You know, certainly you would probably want data in test tubes and animals before you would put it into uh, pregnant women. But, but we really just can't escape the fact that we need those data. I mean, people's lives depend on us knowing the answers to these questions. Mm. Uh, news out this week uh, showing from the CDC, this is a data from the CDC showing that vaccinated pregnant women can help protect babies after they are born. But again, this gets at your point of the, the OBGYNs, clinical providers need to be able to point to research and information to share with pregnant women. Um, Dr. Johnston, you know, there is a concern about how women can advocate for themselves uh, in, in, in a doctor's office, in a study, and also how well they're listened to, especially women yeah. of color. Uh, how does that influence parity in trials and research? Oh, I think that has a huge influence. And, you know, we've we've talked about it. Women are 50 percent of the population. And so I think mobilizing women can be a little bit more difficult than, you know, for example, in HIV, um, gay men are, are quite a strong uh, activist group and have advocated very successfully over the years for um, for improved treatment and access to trials and information. But women, you know, there's such a diversity among women, as you say, there's different race, different age. You know, just because we're women doesn't mean that we all kind of think and feel as one. And so I, I do think that's really a challenge. I do think it's going to have to start with physicians because or, or you know, other healthcare care providers, because they are the touch point where women get their medical care. So if we could get healthcare care providers to be more aware of the issues facing women, and the value of including women in research, not only as research subjects, by the way, but you know, all of us bring our own stories and our own experiences to the whole, you know, medical treatment of anything. You know, we can learn certainly a lot from the individual experiences of, for example, women when they participate in a trial or even when they have a conversation with their physician. So I would encourage, you know, physicians to take the lead and really try to start having that conversation with um, all of the people in their care. And then, you know, for women to have the confidence and know how to raise these questions for themselves, consider, you know, whether you want to be part of a clinical trial and if so, how much involvement do you think you can commit to? And then maybe raise the idea with your physician. You know, I, I think there are people who find it very rewarding to be a part of clinical research. You can learn more about yourself and your own condition, but also to feel that you're making a contribution rather than just being the problem, so to speak. You know, there's really, I think, you can get a real sense of satisfaction from knowing that you're helping medical science progress. You're helping not only yourself, but other people who identify similarly to you, be that as a woman or or any other of the identities that you might have. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Johnston. We really appreciated hearing from you today. Thank you, my pleasure. I'll be back in just a few minutes with my next guest, Sarah Jenke and Katherine Sands. So please stay with us. It's one of the safest cars on the road. At least, that's what the TV ads and website accolades will tell you. Yet every time a female gets behind the wheel, she's 73% more likely to be injured. 
and 17% more likely to die in an accident than a male driver in that same car. Simply put, vehicles are made to perform best in government safety tests using the same male crash dummies they've used for the past 40 years. It's well past time our government demands gender equity in auto safety tests. Help make vehicles safer for us all. Visit VerityNow.org. Hello, I'm Elise Labatt of American University, and today we're talking about gender disparities in vehicle safety. In the U.S., women are over 17% more likely to die and 73% more likely to be seriously injured in a vehicle crash than men. So to talk about the need for more equitable vehicle safety standards, I'm joined by Beth Brook and Susan Molinari. They're the co-chairs of Verity Now. Ladies, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. A pleasure. Beth, let's start with you. Why should we be paying special attention to women's safety in cars uh, as opposed to men? Well, it's actually pretty simple, Elise. I, men are more likely to cause the car crash and women are more likely to die in the car crash. And the statistics you gave were 73% more likely to be severely injured, 17% more likely to die. Why is that? Well, it's because auto safety standards have been designed to protect a male body, not a female body. Look, for years, we know that cars have been designed by men for men. But who knew that auto safety standards uh, follow the same path, designed by men for man, men, actually using a man, a male crash test dummy. That's right. And, it, and it, it, this dates back to the 70s. This, the test started out biased using male crash test dummies, and they've stayed that way ever since. Um, a women, a true women's body is not used in the driver's set seat um, for our five-star safety ratings, and it needs to be. We need safety standards for all different body types. Women are physio physiologically different than men. We also sit closer to the steering wheel oftentimes. And so the standards just need to reflect equitably the bodies of men and women, and the technology now exists to do so with male and female crash test dummy. So Susan, Beth mentions that this was started in the 1970s, these tests, but it sounds yeah. like we're in the 1950s here. I mean, why are these safety standards still yeah. biased towards males? It sure does, doesn't it? It sounds like we are going back uh, so many generations. Look, in 1970, DOT created the crash test dummy based on a 170 pound, five foot nine male. 20 years later, somebody told DOT that women were driving too. So they created a female test crash, crash test dummy, which was really just a smaller version of the male, mini, mini male. That's what they were dealing with. And so we're still using that mini male as, as an example of the crash test dummies that are in cars and are being used at DOT. Nothing has changed. And the fact that nothing has changed isn't because there are not options out there. There's a Thor fifth generation that takes into account all those physiological issues that Beth has been talking about. Europe has implemented it, DOT has validated it. It's time to stop studying and actually get this crash test dummy into cars. So if these options exist and it's not so hard, I mean, why haven't they addressed this inequity before? And what are the barriers for just getting it done? Well, so they will, DOT and others will tell you that number one, they are using female crash test dummies, which as we've already discussed are just mini males. Um, they are still using us on neighborhoods testing crashes, not on highways. Um, they will also tell you that cars are getting safer, which gratefully they are. Um, the, the amount of reports of injuries for men and women are going down. But the statistics that you mentioned are still the same. Women are still dying and getting injured at a much higher rate. And then lastly, they will throw at you that um, women and men drive different cars, that men drive the big SUVs and tractors and whatever, uh, pickup trucks, and women drive the smaller cars. And I can't even address that as a safety measure. <laughs> it's like, you I need to protect wanna, no matter what. I don't even want to go there. I drive an SUV, so <laughs> I don't know what that says. But Beth, um, the Department of Transportation just released its National Roadway Safety Strategy last month introduced key actions to enable safer vehicles. Does that strategy go far enough for what we're talking about? And what else, what are the other couple of things that can be done to ensure that women are considered equally when it comes to vehicle safety standards? 
Yeah, it's it's amazing. No, the strategy does not go far enough. It's a great strategy and it's calls out the need to focus on vehicle safety, but it ignores this issue. It doesn't even acknowledge that the, that there is a disparity in crash test safety standards between men and women. It very clearly NHTSA needs to require that female crash test dummies be used in the driver's seat for all tests in the NCAP five-star safety rating program, full stop. So that when I go to buy a new car, I know that that five-star safety rating applies to me as a woman, just as it applies to a man. Women guaranteed are going into car dealerships today, buying more cars than men, driving more on the road than men, and yet don't know that the standards are not equitable. It can be done with a stroke of a pen. It doesn't require legislation. We just simply need to change the rule. And the strategy is perfect. Just, just take the executing step to change the rule. Well, I mean, with all the gains we've made towards women's rights, it's high time that women are given equal um, consideration when it comes to vehicle safety. And, and Beth, as you said, it might just come down to that purchasing power. Beth Brooke and Susan Molinari, co-chairs of Verity Now, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll send it back now to the Washington Post. Welcome back to Washington Post Live. I'm Libby Casey, politics and accountability anchor. My next guests today are Sarah Jenke from the Center for Fire, Rescue and EMS Health Research. Welcome, Sarah. Happy to be here. And Catherine Sands from Women in Federal Law Enforcement. Hello, Catherine, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. A reminder to our audience, you can join our conversation by tweeting questions to my guests. Write to us at Post live. Sarah, let, let's start with you. You know, right now, men still make up a majority of the firefighter workforce, but there's evidence showing more women are joining. Just describe to us the protective gear used by firefighters. We all know what it looks like, but what really goes into it? And what challenges do women face with that design? So typically firefighters wear bunker gear, which is the coat, the pants, the um, boots, gloves, they have helmets, and then they also have um, the SCBA, so the self-contained breathing apparatus. And it, you know, like everything else in the conversation this morning, was designed for men. And a lot of women, we have um, reports of about 80% of women firefighters say that the gear that they wear is not, uh, is ill-fitting, that there's something that doesn't fit well about it. Only when we asked in a survey that we did about the percent of women who believe they had good fitting gear, it was less than a quarter of the women. Now, granted, this can also be a, an issue for smaller stature of men, but when you think about all the things firefighters are exposed to on the fire ground, it's really important that that gear fit you well. Everything from the carcinogens to um, the heat and the smoke and those types of things. So it's it's really a challenge, um, and, and it's one of the things. There's there is a late, low rate of women in the fire service, so around five to ten percent, depending on the way the way that data is sampled. Um, but I do believe that one of the reasons that that is an issue and recruitment and retention is an issue is the fact that gear is not designed for women. There are some new designs that are coming out for women, um, but often departments, even when those new designs are available, aren't choosing them. So I think it's an issue of safety. I think it's an issue of um, what that message says to women about how much they're wanted or or are um, going to be accepted into the fire service. But I, I think in general, there are a lot of um, concerns around gear, and I think that it's a major sticking point that is fortunately getting more attention now than it has in the past. Sarah, do you talk to firefighters who are women who are having to sort of rig things up or, you know, fix things, trying to make gear smaller or shorter or, you know, bigger in different places? Like, what are they doing? And of course, does that raise a lot of serious safety concerns about how the gear can work properly? 
It shocks me that in 2022, we're still hearing some of the stories we're hearing. Things like um, in some large, well-funded departments, women in, um, you know, come into Recruit Academy and they are told, given boots that don't fit and they're told just layer. The women like kind of have this network where they talk to each other and they're told to just layer several pairs of socks. I've also worked with women who have said, you know, I was in a training or I was in a fire and my boots came off. They were so much too big for me. I, there's a lot of... Um, you know, cinching things in, tying things up. And there's kind of a way to to hack that that a lot of women share. But I, I think of that in terms of if you, beyond the safety issue, if a male came into the fire service and they were given these like tight fitted, um, you know, female designed pieces of clothing or gear and said like, just make that work for you. Like make that, I, it just blows my mind that it's 2022 and this is still a conversation. Catherine, let's turn to women in law enforcement. You know, the gear on the front lines is crucial for safety. Let's start with ballistic vests. Uh, you know, you can tell pretty quickly that one size does not fit all, and yet the consequences can be deadly. How well are they fitting people of different body types, Catherine? Well, the manufacturers have made uh, ballistic vests for women. Uh, one of the problems is that agencies just buy men's vests and tell the women you're going to have to deal with it. Uh, so that defies the uh, the safety issues because the man's vests have uh, things like larger armholes. So your, uh, your whole side may be exposed. And if you are shot in the side, you have a, a greater lethality. Um, so it's it's not protecting you the way it's supposed to. I was listening to an interview with a former police officer. Her name's Rosa Brooks, and she was a law professor who decided to go into the police force to see what it was like. And she was talking about just how much stuff officers have to carry. You know, we're talking about the radio, handcuffs, gun, flashlight, just a range of things, pepper spray. Um, and are these things designed so that a woman's body can carry them, Catherine? Are they, is there talk or development about how anyone can carry all of that in sort of a healthy and safe way, much less women. Well, uh, the the sheer weight is is a problem, and it does cause um, issues for both men and women. Uh, the bigger problem for women is they tend to have a smaller waist, and so you're trying to put much more equipment, and it just doesn't fit. Now you do see um, where vests are going to uh, the. Um, outward wearing and so people are now starting to hang things on their vests like uh, a taser or a radio of, of sorts and that also changes your center of gravity which uh, then starts creating a whole other different type of uh, injury, uh, use injury uh, to you. Um, there has been some inroads in uh, changing some of the equipment, for example, the duty belt in um, uh, a uniform position, but those things aren't uh, changed for people who are in the, um, uh, the non-uniform sections. For example, having to go out and buy a suit and try to find one with belt loops that you can put the proper size belt on so you can literally carry the gun on your hip. Mm. So let's talk to both of you about what are the real life consequences of this? You know, Sarah, what are the health concerns that female firefighters face and what are you finding in your research? So we recently conducted a study where we looked at the health of women in the fire service, surveyed women, career and volunteer, and we found that if women reported their gear didn't fit, they were way more likely to report some type of injury. And so I think there's a very clear safety issue. But we're also looking at different things like um, cancer rates, and we do know that firefighters are at increased rates for several different types of cancer. Um, there are a lot of reports from women we've talked to about how SCBAs are not designed to fit around their face. And so while gear in the, you are going to be exposed to carcinogens on the fire ground, but ill-fitting gear actually increases the chance that carcinogens are going to get into the body. We know that they have, um, it, it, it looks like they have higher rates of both um, uh, cervical cancer and breast cancer and other types of cancers. We also are finding um, high rates of miscarriage often in the first trimester when women don't even know that they're pregnant yet. So I think that it's kind of the entire compilation. I think ill-fitting gear um, has very real immediate and chronic long-term consequences. 
for women in the fire service. Yeah, Catherine, let's go to you for for that same question about just how does ill-fitting gear uh, affect women in law enforcement? It just makes it harder to do your job. Uh, it, everything from, you know, if you're if you're wearing gloves and they don't fit right and you have to draw a weapon, uh, how does that how does that work? Or you have to draw a taser or or a, a baton of some sort as you're trying to negotiate with people. You know, we do uh, much more hands on um, when there is a non-compliant situation. So not having your equipment uh, seated right on a belt or uh, not having um, things secured properly because they don't fit on you right puts everybody's life in danger, not just the officer. Catherine, do you hear the same thing that Sarah talked about, about sort of a, a, a way that women share tips and talk and say, look, here's how I've rigged this up. Here's how I've adapted. Do you see that same thing on the force? To a degree, uh, you know, there's um, uh, uh, pathways, you know, people talk about, oh, you should have your, your suits made by this person because they make the they make suits that work really well if you're on protection detail for like Secret Service or diplomatic security. Um, others might be talking about where's the best place to get good shoes and things like that. So let's talk, Catherine, about the military. We've seen the military integrating more specialized fits for female service members. What do women need in terms of gear if they are on duty on the front lines in the military? Well, the military is still struggling with trying to find the right um, combination of fit for women on, in combat, and they haven't solved it yet either. Um, so it's, it's a universal problem for everybody. It just varies a little bit by profession. Mm. So the most recent data, Catherine, that we're seeing shows that like only almost 14% of federal law enforcement officers were female. This is back in 2016. Do you think the lack of data sort of contributes to a narrative that women are not a crucial part of federal law enforcement or even local law enforcement? Oh, sure. Uh, if you don't have accurate figures to, to uh, start to ascertain what the issues are and how to solve them, uh, how do you come up with an answer? So Sarah, I want to talk to you more about your research looking at all female samples of, of health outcomes in the fire service. And you mentioned something about pregnancy. So, so let's talk about how one thinks about keeping pregnant firefighters or potentially pregnant firefighters protected and safe. It, well, it's a challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge for, for the departments. It's a challenge for the women. Um, and that's where I think, I mean, I think Catherine just hit the nail on the head. We've got to have more data. And, you know, on one hand, like we found these higher rates of miscarriage for women firefighters in the general population. We found an even higher rate for volunteer firefighters than career firefighters. So what do you do with that information? I think back to the conversation earlier, we need to be educating um, OBGYNs about what the risks are. We need to be educating uh, firefighters about what the risks are so they can make informed decisions. But I also think someone challenged me on, well, do we need to be careful about what we say about this? Because what if this says means we should discourage women from getting into the fire service? Is this going to discourage women? Is this going to discourage departments? I think it's a whole issue of family planning in general. There are some studies that find rates of um, infertility among males in the fire service are higher than the general population. And that's out of study out of Europe. Um, so I think that it really doesn't speak to like, we should be thinking about specifically only women. We need to be thinking about holistic understanding that people in the fire service, people in the workforce are, are, are people first. And, and I think that the concerns that we see with, with miscarriage and reproductive health I, I think it's not just going to be, as we get more data, just with the women. I think we're seeing, you know, there's a study out of the University of Arizona where they're looking at um, at sperm and the impact of fighting fires on sperm. I think it's, as we talk about looking at making a more equitable environment for women, I think it really pushes back to like, we just need to make a more equitable environment for everybody and understand people are people and not, you know, everyone's not the same. Um, so I think that is one of the benefits of 
creating the conversation and starting conversations about um, women, women specific issues Mm -hmm. is really understanding that they are people specific issues. But we are finding some concerns with reproductive health. There's some data to suggest it's early, but there is some data to suggest that there could be some negative outcomes, um, child health outcomes. So the more research needs to be done on that. But I think like Catherine said, we, we have to have the research to know what the questions are to know if we're improving things. Catherine, do you see the same thing that, as Sarah talked about, that learning more about female health can, can help all health overall, that, that proper research and more information can help everyone? Oh, absolutely. In law enforcement in general, we suffer from a high level of obesity and heart disease. Uh, And some of the research is indicating that uh, premenopausal women, which are considered to be uh, less prone to heart disease, that that may not be true in law enforcement. And uh, but we just don't have enough research in that area. And uh, we also um, going with Sarah, uh, we have agencies without uh, pregnancy policies. Uh, You just kind of wing it as you as you're going through your your career. So uh, trying to figure out how to get everybody on an even keel so that we understand how families can uh, navigate through a career in law enforcement or uh, in uh, the fire service or any of the first responder services is critical to maintaining uh, a number of people in in a career. Now, Sarah, I read the story of uh, a woman firefighter who was on duty in Britain back in the mid-1990s. Her name was Fleur Lombard, and she died while she was at work. And the cause of her death was attributed to ill-fitting gear um, because these extreme temperatures were able to get in her suit. The temperatures got over like 600 degrees Celsius, which is over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, under her clothing and gear. And it was a big moment for research and a discussion about how protective gear needs to fit female bodies. Can you talk to us about just the the improvements or the education that's happened in in the last three decades over time? So I was actually um, disturbed to see the date of that because I thought, wow, it's been 30 years and it's not, we're still having the same conversation in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I, I won't, I won't say completely, like there has been work, there's, um, FEMA has recently funded through their um, R&D fire prevention grants, a study to look specifically at women's gear and what's working, what's not. So I do think that there's um, significant effort being made right now. And I I think I'm cautiously optimistic that we're seeing an area of improvement. And I I think, you know, the fact that this is a conversation that you chose to pick up and, and air is part of that shift that we need to see to see true change. But the fact that that happened in 1996, and I know of women who last week were crawling out of their boots in a uh, fire training, live fire training, like there's so much work that still needs to be done. But I think that we're starting to see, at least I maybe be too Pollyannish about this, but I think we are starting to see a shift where people are taking this seriously and going, okay, enough talking about it. What are we going to do? How are we going to make sure that departments know what's available. And Catherine, final thoughts from you just about what you'd like to see done immediately. What are changes that can be implemented right away, uh, whether it's in terms of legislation, whether it's in terms of of what's actually provided or given to women on the job? Well, the easiest thing, it doesn't require anything except leadership within uh, police departments and and agencies to ensure that their contracting groups are purchasing the proper equipment for all their employees, not just uh, the women. I mean, everybody needs to have the proper protective equipment that protects them throughout their careers. All right, well, Sarah Jenke, Catherine Sands, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciated hearing from both of you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here today. I'm Libby Casey. To check out what interviews we have coming up, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and to find out more information about all of our upcoming programs. Thank you for watching.